Welcome, food enthusiasts, to another episode of the Future Foodcast. I'm Pam Miller, your host, and I am really excited. This is such an interesting topic and different from some of the other topics that we've covered here on the Future Foodcast. Today, I have with me Christian Vestrom. He is the founder of Soil Steam International, and he's currently Chief Growth Officer. He's in charge of sales and marketing, and I can't wait for you to hear all about what they're doing at Soil Steam. Welcome to the podcast, Christian. Thank you very much, Pam. Yeah, we are so glad to have you. First of all, what what do you do there at Soil Steam? Just briefly, we're going to get into all the details, but give us a, a quick overview of what you do. Well, we have um, we have developed a technology for fighting weed seeds uh, and soybean organisms in soil simply by using steam. So instead of using chemicals and uh, and all the other needed things in order to get things grow in the soil. Uh, we are replacing that simply by adding steam into the soil. Yeah, such a simple solution to a really big problem. How did you even, I mean, you're a founder of this company, like how, how did you get this idea? How, what caused you to start the company? Can you tell us a little bit? Yes, uh, that's a long story. I mean, oh. um, <laughs> <laughs> we started, I'm uh, raised in a farm. My father was a farmer. And even though I took like uh, my uh, my studies within economics, I was uh, I was you know um, I was raised in this farm, and uh, my father started to see problems in the soil already in in the late 1990s. They had problems with weed, but even more often problems with fungi and uh, and some <laughs> a small a small um, worm that we call nematodes. Okay. which is frequently mm -hmm. found more and more often in all kinds of soil. Yeah. And that there are no chemicals that were worked on these kinds of uh, problems. And then they started to look into all kinds of, all, I mean, if the chemicals doesn't work anymore, what, sh what should we do? And then they you know, started to go to, at that time, uh, it was not so much, not so, not so easy to Google either. Yeah, so right. To, <laughs> <laughs> no internet to look it all up in right <laughs> well, now. Well, it was in the early beginning, but still. Uh, so they went to some libraries and stuff like that and found out that, you know, uh, steam has been worked that has been used in agriculture since the 1850s or something. Oh my goodness. Okay. So then, then they started to see, you know, okay, what was successful and what was not uh, with this method and why did it, uh, why is this um, knowledge, uh, when did it disappear? And the answer to that is that when all the chemicals came and were very easy and cheap and fast uh, in the 1950s, uh, this knowledge disappeared. So um, in the in 1950 1960 you still had classes in in you know big uh, universities about soil steaming, wow. but uh, but nowadays that uh, that knowledge is gone. So what they did they started to look at you know what was done what did they do at that time um, with with the steaming of the soil and then they started to make like simple prototypes based on you know the the old knowledge. And um, that went on for, that was three farmers that spent all their time, you know, uh, all their spare time in evenings and then the vacations and whatever. They were out in the field testing this equipment. Well, and Christian, farmers don't really have much spare time. It's a <laughs> very it. oh. labor intense job. I mean, when you, when you're a farmer, that's, it, so that, that was a, a great commitment on their part. Wow. Definitely. I mean, um, I mean, uh, we call it moonshine farmer here in Norway. And that means that you have, they are working day and night. I mean, okay. um, and, um, yeah. and, um, but what they did was that they actually had some simple trials where already in the early 2000s, they have, they were uh, cooperating with uh, academia. So they, okay. there were scientists out in the field with them and test the results, oh. which showed like great results. Step by step, they made like uh, all by themselves almost. They had some simple mechanic solutions, stuff like that, and, and moved forward and, and made more and more advanced uh, equipment. And uh, uh, actually, by that time, I mean, my father died in 2013. Oh, and by that time, they had, yes. At that time, he, uh, they had achieved quite a lot. They had quite a lot of good results, and, but the machine was still too simple and you know, difficult for a normal operator to run. I mean, okay. it has to be like a specialist to run it, stuff like that. But the results were amazing. So, so after a while, um, 
uh, my father was, you know, the the engine in, in that kind of uh, the work uh, of that machine. So when he died, you know, all the um, the whole process stopped. And then after a couple of years, I was all constantly thinking of, you know, the results they had and all the yeah. all the all the great stuff which they had been, you know, spent ten years and a lot of money and hours to achieve. And now all these papers was, was in my my dad's, you know, all the all the shelves so after a while I, I figured out i couldn't leave that so I, I called up the two other old farmers which you know was working with him and asked if they were interested in you know starting up all over again yeah wow and that's the that's the beginning of that story obviously they were yes, and they i'm so glad even though you studied economics and not necessarily but you have that farming background it's your mm-hmm. family uh, even though you weren't maybe your dad had a little bit of that engineering mind Mm. if he was working on trying to figure out the best how to do the the mechanics of it and the machinery Uh, but to me the most important thing coming out of this I mean the dedication is amazing and just the seeing the vision of that but getting having the the wisdom to get the data Mm. (laughs) to be able to know that it was effective you know that there's a big movement right now in um, farming to get away from chemicals. People are trying to figure out how to be good stewards of the soil that we have. And it seems to me that soil steam is a, a really great solution. I'm, I'm so excited to be talking to you today because I, I can't wait to get this information out. Um, so where do you go? Like, what do you do now? What's, what's happening now? Well, um, Yes, since uh, only for the last like five or 10 years, uh, I mean, uh, you know all the story about uh, Monsanto and the problems they had in, in the US. And in EU now, they say that they want to reduce all kinds of pesticides by 50% before 2030. Okay. Which is like, um, I mean, what, I, we are talking to farmers all over, all over the world, actually, um, every week, and uh, and they have they have this toolbox, right? Uh, and and early two thousand, that was full of, of different kinds of equipment. Now it's very limited. I mean, okay. the, the, the 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 it's a shortage of uh, of uh, possibility possible solutions is increasing, uh, and uh, and they are more and more frustrated. Mm-hmm. So um, the farmers are calling us uh, when they have huge problems. Uh, and, uh, and of course, we are trying to help them as, uh, as much as possible. But, um, but it's, a big, it's a big, it's a huge market and it's uh, too many areas in the world. I mean, you have areas in California which has been grow, grown so intensively yes. for so long time. So they have this huge amount of problems in the soil, not only weeds, because weeds can be treated by laser or by, you know, by you get, you get this like a robot that picks weeds. You have all sorts of stuff for solving weed problems. Yeah. But under the soil, in the soil layer, that 30 centimeters, which, you know, all the vegetables and berries and fruit are growing, mm-hmm. that area is not possible. You cannot spray something on top of the soil and, you know, and, and do changes further down in the soil and that's the big problem that's what we do with the steaming so the steam is really permeating down lower you know into the soil more than any topical application could is what i'm hearing you say that's the point i mean we can inject we have some special injection systems we inject Ah. the steam into the soil maybe down to three uh, 30 40 centimeters maximum okay which means that we can actually uh, pasteurize uh, the soil layer oh. which the, the vegetable or berries has to use in order to grow okay wow that's amazing and so your challenge is a good one though your market has a problem that you can solve and and your biggest challenge is just being able to reach everyone <laughs> and, and well, probably I mean, creating machinery <laughs> i'm sure you have lots of obstacles but yes i mean uh, there are um uh, first of all i mean w- we have been running different kinds of like uh, full-scale machines uh, okay. that we've been testing out since 2017 in the fields with scientists and and then measuring harvest, uh, storage time, uh, if there comes any weed at all. I mean, all this compared between the steamed field and the conventional treated field. Wow. So we have lots of data now. And I mean, we are more and more sure that, you know, um, we have everything from like 10, 15% increase in yield, which is good. 
But in the maximum level, when you have met farmer with, with big soil borne problems like mm-hmm. fungi and stuff like that, which and the soil is pretty much damaged. Yeah. After soil steaming, that farmer gets like um, um, we had one parsley root uh, grower, which we were steaming for last year, that got three hundred forty percent larger harvest. Oh wow! Now so, that's that's I would say unbelievable if you didn't have the data because you had the before and you have the after you the facts of the case it's not like we think doing this here are the results you actually have that data because these kinds of effects through third party right yes so um but again there are very um, all kinds of variations here because um if if you if you were calling us and said you know i heard soy stimming is fantastic thing Uh, i want you to come to my farm we would ask you, you know, what is your problem? Do you have soil soil fatigue? We call it in Europe, okay. right? Okay, soil, soil fatigue. That's yes. the term, soil yes. fatigue. Okay. Yes, right. If you have that, they can definitely help you every time. How but, how would a farmer know if they had soil fatigue? Like, what I mean, are the what are the symptoms of that? So that so our listeners know, there's probably some listeners out there that are in the farming area. So I just mm-hmm. want to define that, if you could. Well. A farmer will know that. An experienced okay. farmer will know that. But, but of course, for instance, if you grow, if you're a carrot grower, uh, you should not go back to the same land, uh, not more often than that every seventh year. Okay. You should do crop rotation. Okay. Otherwise, you will have the, like this big. Uh, they will get more and more fungi in the soil mm-hmm. because they they are attracted by the by the carrots, right? Okay. And but many places in the world, uh, you don't have possibility to do crop mm-hmm. rotation. That mm-hmm. was the old worst no farming, right? Right. Today, if you talk to a farmer, the farmer cannot go to the big grocery store one year with carrots, the next year with strawberries, the third year with potatoes. He has something with a, with a delivery right. agreement. Right. That's so right. that's why, I mean, he has to deliver carrots. Okay. And if he, if he don't has like this kind of rotation uh, possibility with a neighbor or something like that, Right. He ends up to grow carrots on the same field way too intensively. Okay. okay. And, and when you do that, the nature is like that. He will get fungi problem, maybe nematode problem. And then, and that is something, if you leave that soil for maybe 10 years, 15 years, he, it might recover because nature right. is fantastic. It will right. recover sooner or later. But if you meet a farmer that can afford to leave his land for 10, 15 years. Yeah, uh, no, they can't. No, yeah. Can't. Because we're running out of we're running out of good usable land as it is. So yes. being a good steward and trying to work on the sustainability of the land that we have, I see that's a great benefit of what you're doing is helping yes. us extend, you know, have sustainability in our source, in our land source. Right. Am I right about that? Yeah, yeah, of course. Okay. I mean, I mean uh, there are I have heard uh, a few uh, um, podcast you know about about um, the pesticide industry industry yes and and i i'm not like uh, i don't think that it is easy or even possible to get away from all the pesticides in in the short run right. because they are so important i mean the pesticides was part of the reason that we are capable of making all this food which we needed for like right. the mm-hmm. last 70 80 mm-hmm. years so we need some pesticides at least for <laughs> for like a, a period of time coming sure but in the same time, we have to get away from them because, I mean, all these pesticides, I mean, people seem to think that, you know, after spraying them out in the field, they're gone, but they are not gone. They end up in the soil or in the water or in the air. Yeah, they're living on. Yes. All right. Well, we talked about maybe the, the yield. So we're, we're really helping the soil and we're, we're essentially being kind to our soil and being a good steward of that resource, which... When done properly, then you can increase. Obviously, you've got the data where you've been able to help farmers increase their yield based on taking care of their soil and yes. not having that soil fatigue and kind of yes. renewing it. In really, uh, yes. but what other benefits are there to soil steam? You know, on the other end, what about whatever's produced? And you talked about shelf life and some other things. What are some of the other benefits? Well, uh, first of all, this is a, a great uh, a contribution to organic farming because organic farming has, I mean, organic farming is a good thing. I mean, you get you get uh, vegetables without pesticides. On the other hand, the organic farmer, he's drowning in weeds, for instance. 
because with no pesticides available, you don't have any control on the weeds. And when you get too much weed, you also get a very poor crop. Okay. So he can, he can steam his soil and have like maybe a better crop than the, the conventional farmer and without any weeds and it's and it's still organic yeah that's so that great. was one, one one point but the i mean we live in northern europe uh, which is uh, has very cold long winters uh, i guess like in the midwest for instance but 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 us is so big so we always have like warm areas which can supply food to the other areas but in northern europe uh, in norway we are, are um, from from um, december every year until may next year we uh, need to import many vegetables, uh, berries, fruit, whatever. And, and uh, in the normal condition, that's no problem. But uh, you see the problem when you are depending on other countries. So it's very clear for us in Europe now where um, all this, uh, the war and, and the crisis uh, relate to that one. So all countries would like more or less to be self-sufficient of food. And when we are steaming the soil, you can imagine a carrot is 15 centimeters long, maybe 20 something. And when we steam that whole soil layer, we reduce the pressure of fungi in that soil. So when the farmer is harvesting the, the carrot from the steam soil uh, in the fall and put it into the warehouse, he, he puts a much stronger carrot without attack from fungi ah. into the warehouse. Okay. And what is happening then? I mean, normally it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a saying in Norway that the farmer, when he drags up three carrots, one of them are going to be wasted because of rotting process in uh -huh. the warehouse. Okay. Because the, the nature of fungi is to attack and break down, you know, organic material. Mm -hmm. But we have reduced the pressure from fungi so much, so they aren't attacking the carrots. So when the farmer takes it up and put it in the warehouse, it can store much longer. Wow. Meaning that it can store so much longer that Norway gets self-sufficient of carrots. Okay, that, no, that's like, hold on, don't move on from that yet. That's like, <laughs> that is really important because a lot of produce, fruits, vegetables, and all that, they're lost in that process after they're taken out of the ground. And now I'm understanding, and I hope our listeners are, more of why that happens. Uh, so not only are you possibly increasing the yield for the farmer, but the strength of the, or the resistance of that particular vegetable or fruit to disease is higher because they're not bringing that out with them. I mean, they're not That's bringing right. that fungi with them to then deteriorate right. in the warehouse. There That's are almost no fungi. There are a little bit, but at, at sure. like maybe 5% of the whole population, okay. which follows the, the crop into the warehouse. Right. And then they don't attack it. So when they open the boxes in April or May from the last fall, they see that Everything is fine. It's no rotting uh, process here. So they can That's... live to the shore instead. And, and yeah. the good thing is, of course, that we don't we waste less food. The mm -hmm. next thing is that um, we don't import food because normally uh, Norway has to import food from Spain or uh, Italy or um, Egypt or south of Europe and even Africa, which is mm -hmm. a lot of transport and, uh, and you know, pollution related right. to that. And, and of course, the carrots which we are importing from south of Europe could be eaten by other people who needs them sure. instead. Sure. Well, you're just changing, I think, the way we think about this problem because there, there is an awareness that we're running out of land, that we need to be good stewards of the land that we have, that our population is increasing and we need to figure out how to feed them. And really, the answer is not always more. The answer mm. is mm. better, like yes. doing better with what we have. That's what I'm hearing. You have a solution for us. Mm. Definitely. In, in, yeah, in, in being able to do better with the resources that we have. And uh, for, for so many reasons, I, I'm a huge fan. I, I already love this whole <laughs> technology, this whole concept. And one of the most fun things that, that I'm thinking about, you know, you just took this old, what we would think, because it's not necessarily technologically advanced, using the greatest, latest mm. science, whatever, used to be used in the 1800s mm. to condition the soil. And you're rejuvenating it and, and finding now we do have the scientific data to back up the fact of how effective it is mm -hmm. in many different ways. It's, it's great. Just, I love it. Okay. So we're going to, we're going to reduce our pesticide use and reality is you're very realistic. We're not going to be able to turn that overnight, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. we're, we can move in the right direction, hitting those that are suffering the most from the soil fatigue and mm -hmm. can, you know, right. 
use this product. Yes, I think it's also very important to mention because I'm sure that some of your listeners, if they are, you know, uh, very interested in, um, if you're interested in soil and, you know, uh, correct kind of food and, and eating and everything, they also will know that you have good, uh, you have good bacteria in the soil as well. Sure. So, uh, and, and we have also, I mean, um, one of the things that we have done, which is, is very, I think it's a very good idea is that they have always been, you know, f- followed by scientists to figure out, you know, what is the result? Uh, what is the bad effect? What is the good effect? Whatever. Yes. And, and what we have seen is that we have uh, in, in different trials we have done, we have tried to add, like you, you can add micro life now. You can, you can buy micro life and add to the soil. Okay. On the other hand, we have been measuring just, just steam the soil. I mean, measuring, you know, the micro life after one month after three months after six months after okay and what we see is that first of all the crop is not uh, is not growing if we add like the good micro life it's 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 the same level as the normal steamed soil without adding micro life mm-hmm. and on the other hand we see that the the good micro life has been in the soil for thousands and thousands of years it has been a combat between you know good and bad organisms which has been in balance okay. but when farmers have been starting to to influence that balance by adding pesticides or uh, growing a p- potatoes whatever the, the balance is not in balance anymore uh, what's happening when we are steaming is that the the the, the natural habitat or micro life which has been there for ages comes back very fast i mean within months okay that good. that normal combat is gone but the big amount of fungi you had, for instance, or big amount or nematodes or the problematic, the really problematic organisms in the soil, which has come there because you have been growing wrong. You have been doing carrots on carrots on carrots, no crop rotation. Mm-hmm. You, haven't, you haven't treated your, your soil good enough. Okay. That we can fix. And then the normal um, balance in the soil can recover and you can continue. So there, there's a time period after you steam and you're trying to repair that, that, that the normal, it's, it's essentially months later, the normal balance is going to be restored. Nature is going to take care of itself and, yes. and all that comes back. Okay. Yes. That's great. It very is, good. It is, I mean, um, it's very good to see that um, na- nature is good, but if we, if we give it the right premises, I think. Yeah, so we're trying to work with nature and not against it, I yes. think is what I'm hearing. Now, there are other applications outside of just food. I mean, that's the purpose of this podcast, but uh, y- there are other applications for steaming soil and be able to be a good steward of it that we might normally be, I don't know, putting it somewhere else or in a landfill, or can you share a little bit yes. about that? Yes, because that's another very important topic. I mean, we were contacted by uh, the biggest uh, railroad builder and, and road builder in, in our country uh, three years ago. And the reason is something which is called um, alien invasive species. Okay. It means that, that there are, there are p- plants which comes from other, other countries that has you know, arrived by maybe by birds, but more often by humans, uh, a bit freighted in and very often in soil. So if you let get this um, beautiful uh, orchid orchid from your friend in Malaysia sent to US, that's not that's, that's not allowed because okay. the soil is problematic. Because okay. in that soil you can have all sorts of seeds and and, and bacteria and everything. So okay. so but that has been you know a problem for many years without actually the authorities um, you know seeing the problem. Mm-hmm. But what's happening now is that we have. Um, there are some famous pictures from Iceland, for instance, where you have a flower called lupin, okay. beautiful flower. But what it does is that it, you know, it starts like a one beautiful flower in, in the end of the field or in the woods or whatever. And very quickly, it's spread all over the place. So you, yeah. if you Google lupins Iceland, you will see like this, you, you don't have an end. It's, it's like the mountains in the far back and then you have oh my lupins. Gosh. Everywhere, yeah. So that, that is to, to describe the problem with this uh, alien invasive species. Mm-hmm. And what they also do is that they take over the natural, you know, where, where other flowers used to grow. Sure, so, they're, do- they're killing out uh, the, maybe the other natural species that have been there. That's correct. Mm-hmm. And I mean, we have uh, for the last 10, 15 years, I've been speaking a lot of, I mean, species which are disappearing in Amazonas, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. This is happening both in the US and in, in Europe as well. Yeah. But in the other way, 
So uh, in north of Europe, it has been very, very strict now that you cannot, I mean, if you have, are going to make a building or uh, a road or whatever, you have to send in uh, people first to take tests of that soil. Oh. If you figure out that you have some of these alien invasive species in that soil, the, the rules are that then you have to take them to landfill. So we take a lot of, I mean, fantastic, beautiful soil for making food for humans and animals and everything. And you put it away. You build a big, like, mountains of, of, of the yeah, most... Yeah, that's... It's, it's a very bad... Uh, and, and also, that's also why it has a lot of focus now. In order to... I mean, you can't see these small seeds in the soil. So mm -hmm. it's very difficult to, to, to figure out if you have invasive species or not in the soil. Mm -hmm. uh, and before we came up with this new machine, there was really not any possibility to make sure that that soil was free mm -hmm. of those things either. Mm -hmm. so, so that is the other, I mean, we are using the machines both in agriculture, but also within construction, so yeah. that these guys can make sure that when they are, are running uh, and, and building roads, whatever, and before they move this soil all over the place, they have to make sure it is clean so that they won't spread this. Well, diseases. Christian, I can't imagine well, the intrusion, first of all, just in the natural land, having to, but the cost to move if you're laying down a roadway or a rail bed. Uh, I, I love the idea of using your technology so much better than, you know, put, moving that just to another place in a landfill where it's not even going to be used for anything. And then you have to no, figure out it. how to set up that roadbed. So that's that's just a great use. I wanted to bring that out because I think you can think outside of just the food space where there's applications. And this is one, you know, in, in Southeast America, which is where I live, we have kudzu. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. It's very invasive yes. and it didn't originate here and it takes over wherever it is. So some of those natural areas, like you were talking about, we have the same mm. problem where it just takes over the trees and you know starts to kill the natural things that were growing there. So I totally understand yeah. what's going on. Um, well, let's, let's shift a little bit. There's one more thing that I wanted to ask you about because just the attitude of everyone that I've talked to at your company, you just seem to have a really great culture there uh, of a positive mindset and excitement about what you're doing as a company. Uh, do you want to speak to that a little bit? You know, culture at companies is a really big topic right now because worldwide, I mean, we're, it, it seems like everyone's having a challenge, but is that, is that the situation for you? Or are you doing well? Uh, yeah, I think, I mean, it's not something that we really have been, you know, uh, working on, like, what should I say? Because we have been so busy, we know, with, with our technology. I mean, we are not many people. We are 18 people, 13 or 14 of those are engineers. So only working on technology to improve, to record everything we do. To, so we have lots of focus on that. But on the other hand, I mean, when, when we see how important what we are doing is, I mean, not only for governmental issues or for, but we have farmers coming to our, our, uh, our office and saying, you know, we had one farmer crying, this, this, sitting in our office crying because we couldn't help him last year. We were, we were full booked, we couldn't help him. Oh. And then you understand, I mean, this is important both on, like, like we have been talking about earlier, on like national level, that you can stop spreading of invasive species, that mm -hmm. you can reduce pesticides and all of that. But you also see it on a very much like day-to-day -day basis with farmers struggling, don't have alternatives, they need help, and, and we can help them. Yeah. So in that kind of uh, attitude, I mean, we have a fantastic culture here because I mean, even it might look like a little bit nerdy and might be um, because even in in uh, in, um, in in lunchtime, we don't talk about football or soccer. We talk <laughs> about soil steaming, and and so we have this attitude, which I mean, we have we have a young uh, just from uh, university coming out. We have yeah. from many nationalities, and all of us are like like one nerdy soil soil steam. <laughs> Company. It's a it's a conglomerate it's a it's a soil nerd convention right at your own company where everybody's on the mission and so interested in that. But yes. that's what makes it that's what makes it exciting. I can tell you love what you're doing. We've talked about a lot of things that you're that that are happening at your company. Is there anything else you want to share with our audience before we go today that we maybe didn't cover or I didn't ask about? Is there anything else you want to share with them? Well, no, I think um, I think we have covered most of the most uh, interesting aspects. We ha we have been to California and we want to go into 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 the U.S., uh, but uh, we are not sure because we want all machines to be 
hundred percent. We don't want to, be the, to do service on machines all over the place. We want to oh. make sure they operate properly and yeah. can be in. I mean, I mean, there are, there are some strict rules when you are going to send machines to the other end of the world. So, mm -hmm. so but um, we look forward. To that is a it's a great nation with a lot of uh, food production. Yeah, and, uh, and some of these so, guys really yeah need for the future. Uh, for your future growth, I mean, there's just a lot of opportunity out there. Is you're in a few a few countries already. I mean, I'm sure California is a big grower for us as well, and um, we have a lot in the South too. The yeah. Midwest, like you said, might be in the winter time a little bit more like Norway. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah you're right. <laughs> but they could use the benefits of the additional storage time and the strength of the produce that is produced to be able to be warehoused and sent to other places uh, later and, mm. and be able to use there. So that's really great. Well, thank you, Christian, for sharing what you're doing. We are so excited to have you on the podcast. And I really look forward to hearing what you guys do in the coming years. Thanks a lot for being with us. Thank you very much, Pam. Thanks for listening to Future Foodcasts. Future Foodcast is powered by Farm to Plate, the leading food blockchain platform. Subscribe on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts to stay up to date with the very latest innovations in the food industry.